everyone, and thank you so much for joining us tonight. We are very lucky to have Lawrence Jordan for his new book, which was published on the 4th of July, The Rough Rider and the Professor, Theodore Roosevelt, Henry Cabot Lodge, and the Friendship that Changed American History. I want to thank the Friends of the Library who bring us these programs. I'd also like to thank Barrett Bookstore, who have the book for sale tonight. Lawrence Jordan is currently an adjunct professor of history at Fordham University, at Fordham University's Lincoln Center campus in New York City. He is also the author of Paving the Way for Reagan, The Influence of Conservative Media on U.S. Foreign Policy. A frequent writer on American politics, his articles have appeared in the New York Times, the San Francisco Chronicle, and the Washington Post. And we are lucky because he lives in Darien, Connecticut. So let's welcome him and uh, sit back and enjoy. Hey, thanks. Thanks so much. Uh, it's wonderful to see so many people here. You know, it's fitting, I think, this is the first talk that I've given on the book. I haven't given one before. And at the core of this book is a story of friendship, camaraderie, and uh, the, the joys that one has of, of, of close friendship and family. And so I feel really honored to see so many friendly faces uh, here this evening. Uh, you know, uh, Kathleen talked about the importance of the library. Uh, we all love the library. It's an honor for me to be here in our community library. Uh, I encourage you, as, as uh, Kathleen made reference to, to support the library whenever you can. It's a wonderful institution. We all have such great memories of being here. Uh, my son Elliot is here all the time, uh, borrowing books and loving the children's programs. And so I just encourage you to, to support the library whenever you're able to. And it's interesting, when I think about this book, this book came out of the COVID experience. It's what one might call a COVID book, <laughs> as um, a lot of people term it. And I have to tell you, that if it was not for the Darien Library, I can honestly say I do not think this book would have been completed. Certainly not in the short time that I had, 16 months, to write it. So I thought, besides telling you a bit about the book, and I'm hopeful you're all gonna read it, be riveted <laughs> by the incredible writing in it, I thought I'd talk a little bit about what I do as a historian and how the library was so important in helping me complete this project. So, I think those of you who come to the library frequently might be familiar uh, with this uh, machine. Uh, it's a, a microfilm machine, and, and this is where um, I did a lot of my work, and thank goodness the library was open. Because during COVID, when I wrote this proposal, and it was a lengthy proposal, and I set it off to an agent who purchased it and then sold it to my publisher, the next thing I thought about after I was given basically a 13 to 15 month time frame of writing it was, uh-oh, it's COVID. Everything's closed. How am I going to get to the 2,500 letters that compose this book and that I based my research on when the Boston, or the, rather the Massachusetts Historical Society, was completely shut down. Couldn't give the money back. Um, so fortunately, Tina Booth, who's this marvelous woman who, who some of you may know, who works in the interlibrary loan office, was able to find a duplicate copy for me of the microfilm of these letters, which is what this machine was used for, and have the letters, or the microfilm, sent from Boston here to Darianne, where I could come down and work on it. So without her, and without all of these incredible people who constantly kept this machine running, because it was breaking down all the time, <laughs> I have to tell you, I would not have gotten this Book done. So I am so grateful to all of the folks here at the library, and they really deserve all the support that they get. So 
continuing on in terms of what I do as a historian, well, I popped down to the uh, library every day for however many months, sat down in this very chair, threaded this microfilm through, and looked at this. Can I, yeah, exactly, my God. Can, can anybody read that? Don't try, because I couldn't. So for those of you who, there are many people who ask, well, what do you do all day? So I spend my time, seven to eight hours a day, staring at stuff like this. And you really can't read it. It's Henry Cabot Lodge. It's a letter that he wrote to Theodore Roosevelt in 1903, when TR was president. Undoubtedly, it's a letter from Lodge asking Roosevelt for something or offering advice, whether Roosevelt wanted it or not, because the two wrote two to three letters to one another every day. So I was not able to read this. And fortunately, a lot of these letters between the two of them, particularly from Lodge, were typed. So I was very grateful to people in the TR library in South Dakota that's being built for translating this stuff. So just for the heck of it, this is Lodge's handwriting. This is Theodore Roosevelt's handwriting. Much more legible. Uh, in fact, you could even probably read it a little bit from here. It's a letter from Lodge to TR in 1910. Lodge, Roosevelt is dashing around Africa on this fantastic uh, safari that he was on, uh, underwritten by the Smithsonian sponsored by Andrew Carnegie. And Lodge was undoubtedly writing this letter, telling him what a disaster everything has become since he left Washington. And now they have William Howard Taft, Roosevelt's successor, who's turned out to be completely dreadful. And he's trying to get Roosevelt to come back into politics. So this is uh, another letter from T Lodge to, uh, from T.R. Lodge. And the interesting thing is the letters, as I said earlier, made up my uh, book. But there was something kind of special about the letters in that these letters, as you one can imagine, are completely authentic. They're also very direct. They're also unabashedly frank. When TR and Lodge wrote to one another, they let it all hang out. It didn't matter what they thought of somebody. They didn't hold anything back. And later on, near the end of Roosevelt's life, they were sitting together. And Roosevelt, who, as some of you know who've read about Roosevelt, know he was excited about everything. He would sprint between classes at Harvard, run from one class to the next, run from one library to the next. And as they were sitting together, and Roosevelt passed away in 1919 at the age of 60. They were sitting together, and Roosevelt said in his, possibly said in his ebullient way, he said, gee, Cabot, just think, if you edited all of these incredible letters that I wrote to you, it could be one of the great books about me in American history. <laughs> now, Lodge was completely different from TR. He was very, uh, he was very Machiavellian, very thoughtful, very cautious, and he thought, yeah, that's an interesting idea. Henry Cabot Lodge was also a historian. He received one of the first history PhDs from Harvard. And the more he thought about publishing these letters completely as they were, the more he didn't like the idea. Because TR made some comments about certain individuals, people like former President Benjamin Harrison, who he called a little toad and a boob. <laughs> Not something a former president really, you really want to see a former president say. And Lodge actually wrote to Roosevelt's uh, widow, Edith, and said, Theodore would not want to be portrayed in this authentic way, so I'm going to do the best I can to make sure these letters never see the light of day. And so Lodge edited the letters I just showed you. These letters and what's in here are completely different. Lodge removed passages from letters. He crossed out words. He changed words, all for the benefit 
of his good friend Theodore Roosevelt, and perhaps a little bit for him. Because remember, all these folks are trying to manipulate, change history. But why should we be surprised? Henry Cabot Lodge was a very careful politician. He was a very scrupulous individual. And he wasn't transparent in any way, shape, or form, except when you see a picture like this. <laughs> so this is Henry Cabot Lodge, a young Henry Cabot Lodge in the 1880s, standing. It's a beautiful picture, really, if you really look at it. The light is exquisite. Standing above the cliffs of his family estate at Nahant, which is on the eastern shore of Massachusetts, a very rustic environment. And Lodge loved skinny dipping. He absolutely loved it. And he wrote about how much he loved it. And Lodge loved Nahant. It was his, as we might say today, his happy place. He learned to ride there. He learned to sail there. He learned to play tennis there. It was the place that he was more comfortable in than any other place. He had a large, beautiful townhouse in Washington, which had stables because he was a great horseman, a large library where he would stalk the floor every evening late into the night, composing speeches he was to deliver in the Senate the following day. Lodge loved Nahant. This is a picture of the actual home, which was known as East Point. And Roosevelt, and I know there's a pointer that I can use and I'm not going to, he would sit there on the veranda with Lodge and his wife and they would talk about Shakespeare, they would talk about literature. And it was also the center of Lodge's congressional or political power really. He was elected the congressman from Lyme, which essentially is right next to Nahant, and this is where he spent his whole political career. He, he loved it far more than the very ostentatious places such as Newport or Palm Beach or other places that dominated the Gilded Age. Lodge wanted nothing to do with them. So since I had a rather uncomplimentary photograph of Henry Cabot Lodge, a rather an embarrassing photograph, this is another photograph of Theodore Roosevelt a beautiful, a very nice uh, picture, dressed in a uh, Brooks Brothers outfit, which he had uh, made to his specifications. And this is taken in 1885. Roosevelt, like Lodge, who loved the rustic world of Nahant, lo Roosevelt loved the West. He was often in Dakota Territory, which is where he had a ranch which he tried to make successful, a cattle ranch which inevitably failed, as so many of Roosevelt's businesses did. But he loved the West. And 1885 was a year that he realized he needed to take a little bit of a break because 1884 had been a difficult year for Theodore Roosevelt and Henry Cabot Lodge. In 1884, Theodore Roosevelt was a young politician had been working up in Albany, was looking forward to the birth of a child from his, by his wife, his first wife, Alice Lee, a woman from a very well-known Boston family. She was actually a distant cousin of Lodge's. And they probably met uh, he and Roosevelt briefly at one of the many engagement parties that they had. But as Alice prepared to deliver, things didn't go according to plan. She developed Bright's disease. Roosevelt was sent a wire up in Albany. His wife was having difficulties, massive complications. He was told to hurry back as quickly as he can. Now, 1884, it's not like today. Roosevelt hopped on the train at Albany, but it was a slow, long ride down the Hudson. By the time he reached New York City, his wife was near death, and his mother, who had contracted typhoid fever, was on death's door as well. So think about that. 
this man who lost the two most important women in his life, two most important people in his life, at one moment. How do you go on? How do you carry forward? It wasn't easy. Combined with that, there were other difficulties that awaited Roosevelt that year. And one of them was the campaign for president in 1884. This was the campaign or the convention that bound Lodge and Roosevelt together against this man, James Blaine, who was a very prominent politician in the Gilded Age, had been Secretary of State, a US Senator, Speaker of the House, was determined to be President of the United States. He was one of the most glamorous politicians of his day, dressed exquisitely. He was known as the Plume Knight because of these incredibly beautiful plumed long tailcoats that he wore with these brass buttons. As you can see, he has this very prominent beard. There is a story which I think is apocryphal that apparently there had been a gunman sitting atop the US Capitol and he noticed James Blaine from at least a mile away and decided to take a shot at him purely because of that beard which came into focus. I don't know if it's true or not. Roosevelt and Lodge meet and get to know one another during this Chicago convention of 1884. They both choose to support Blaine, even though deep down they cannot stand him. They had tried to topple his nomination. They failed to do so. They had been elected by their respective delegations in Massachusetts and New York, and both decided out of duty to their states to go along and nominate James Blaine. This did not go well uh, for those uh, who they once called friends. When Lodge returned to Boston, he was running for Congress that year in 1884. All of those who he had known at Beacon Hill, and Lodge was a very, very social guy, had tons of friends, was out at dinners and parties all the time. Those invitations stopped coming. Lodge was a member of the Somerset Club in Boston, couldn't get anybody to have lunch with him anymore. He never forgot it. Henry Cabot Lodge was not a forgiving man. He had a long memory. If you supported him, he'd do anything for you. He did this uh, years later for many, different, uh, for many different individuals, but if you crossed him, forget it. So the convention ends. Lodge and Roosevelt are basically on their own. Lodge goes, Roosevelt goes to Dakota to try to recover from this horrible convention experience and most importantly try to recover from the loss of his wife and mother. Henry Cabot Lodge, however, doesn't give up. He's determined to succeed in politics. Now this is actually, I think, a really great photograph of the two men and it really demonstrates their personality. I mean, it's really not too hard to see what both men were like, what their characters were like, what their personalities were like. Here's Henry Cabot Lodge. He was a fabulous rider, as I said. He's on his favorite black horse named Toronto, something he rode frequently up at Nahant, at East Point. Roosevelt rode him too. This is a very famous picture of Theodore Roosevelt. The rumor has it that there was a photographer standing around. This was after Roosevelt had become, after Roosevelt left the White House. And the gentleman said, hey, Mr. President, would you mind uh, getting on your horse and jumping this fence? I'd love to take a picture of you. Roosevelt said, sure, go ahead. Gets on the fence, gets on the horse, jumps the fence, takes the picture, one take. But these were very special men, because they were both men of affluence, both Harvard educated, both men of wealth, both men of privilege, men who very easily could have laid back on their laurels and done basically nothing. But that was not the way they were. Both men idolized their fathers, both their fathers had said, as uh, Theodore Roosevelt's father had said, one can't spend their life as an oyster. Henry Cabot Lodge, 
uh, his father, John Lodge, was the same way. He said, a man, if he has time, can do basically anything he wants to do. And both Lodge and Roosevelt decided to do something and enter a profession where they could make decisions that would stand the test of time. Neither one of them were great orators. Lodge, in fact, had a voice that one journalist described as being so horrible it reminded him of the tearing of a bedsheet. <laughs> Lodge actually joked one time that his voice was so bad it sounded like a dentist's drill. And if you actually go online and you can hear Henry Cabot Lodge talking, it really does sound like a drill. <laughs> Theodore Roosevelt had a very high-pitched voice. He was very charismatic. Uh, both men were very knowledgeable. They loved history, sports, literature. As you can tell, they loved dressing well. They loved living well. They were also men with very uh, serious tempers which could explode at any moment and did. And one story I'll tell you kind of describes this. When Lodge was in his late 60s, Around 1917, he was about to enter the Senate to support Woodrow Wilson in the Senate resolution to go to war against Germany in World War I. He was confronted by a constituent who was in his early 30s and had played minor league baseball. Lodge was, had made up his mind. He was going to support the president, didn't like Woodrow Wilson, actually hated him. But he was going to do his duty and go to the Senate and do what he believed was right. And this gentleman confronted him, and he accused Lodge of being a coward. He went like this. And Lodge, who believed that character and virtue were the coin of the realm, and this a man in his late 60s, reared back and punched the guy right in the face. <laughs> and basically had to be restrained. Otherwise, who knows how bad the situation would have been. So these are the two men that I wrote about. There was no quit in them. They never gave up. They might have started out in lives where one might have thought they would be soft. These men were not soft. They were hard men. And they were determined to succeed and determined to do what they could to enhance the greatness of the United States. And that's what they attempted to do. I want to talk a little bit about the women in these two men's lives. Women play a great role in the lives of Henry Cabot Lodge and Theodore Roosevelt, and I had a ball writing about them. On the left is Edith Kermit Corot Roosevelt. Theodore Roosevelt's second wife. She loved Theodore Roosevelt from the moment she saw him when they were children. They spent all their time together. She wanted to marry him almost from the get-go. But there was a slight problem. Edith's family, which had once been prominent, was virtually destitute. And her father, who had come with the sign of a very wealthy family, showed no business aptitude, did show an aptitude for alcohol, which essentially led to the ruin of the family business and forced the family to move from one relative to another, or as Tennessee Williams said, rely on the kindness of strangers. So the marriage initially did not take place. The gossip was that Theodore Roosevelt's family didn't want their son to marry a woman whose family essentially had no prospects, and she had no prospects financially either. But he ends up, as I said, marrying Alice Lee. The marriage ends with her death, and soon the two of them are back together. They marry, and it was probably the best decision that Theodore Roosevelt ever made. This picture actually is TR's, or was, TR's favorite photograph. He carried, with, he carried it with him everywhere during his grand tour of Africa and Europe in 1910. It was referred to stylistically as the goddess 
photo. And Edith Roosevelt was wonderful for Theodore Roosevelt. She was one of the few people who could keep this man's enormous energy, titanic temper, in check. Lodge could do that as well, and the two of them often worked together to try to guide Roosevelt away from one of the many precipices that he often found himself on, because he would often say things that he shouldn't have said, do things that he shouldn't have done. The other photograph, and this is not as easy to see as I would like, is of Henry Cabot Lodge's wife, known as Nanny Lodge. And Nanny Lodge was a very special woman, and I confess she was my favorite character in the whole book to write about. Nanny Lodge was unique among women of the Gilded Age. She was not simply one of these uh, beautiful swans to float around the debutante halls of Boston and in New York. She was Wellesley educated. She had a photographic memory. She had an audiographic memory. She could talk about history, literature. Her father was a very well-known naval officer. Nanny could sit for hours with whomever talking about naval affairs. And she was sought out by politicians to talk about foreign policy, politics, naval affairs. One of them, one of the men who sought her out was none other than James Blaine. Theodore Roosevelt and Henry Cabot Lodge's great nemesis. In fact, one particular story was that when uh, Theodore Roosevelt was looking for a job, um, Blaine, who was uh, Secretary of State under Benjamin Harrison, had a vacant position as an Undersecretary under of State. Henry Cabot Lodge, and this shows you the devotion that Henry Cabot Lodge had for Theodore Roosevelt, went and groveled before James Blaine and begged him to hire Theodore Roosevelt as his undersecretary of state. And Blaine was very gracious but said he really couldn't do something like that because Roosevelt was known as a man who liked to go off the reservation. And when Blaine went on vacation in Bar Harbor, he didn't really want his sleep disturbed by strange wires coming to him at all, all times of the day and night. Nanny Lodge also was her husband's greatest critic. Everything he wrote, every speech he wrote, every book he wrote, and Rose, Rose, uh, Lodge wrote quite a few of them, Nanny would read first and foremost. And if she didn't like it, if there was a letter, such as a letter that Lodge, or rather a speech Lodge had written when he was going to speak at a rally in Massachusetts, Nanny said, this isn't good. He ripped it up and threw it in the fire and started again. He showed her another copy of this same talk. She said, nope, not good. Ripped it up, threw it in the fire, started again. Did that three times before she thought it was good enough. So Nanny Lodge had an enormous impact on her husband. She was a great socialite. She was a great uh, party giver. She had this incredible light wherever she went. And one of the, I want to read a quote to you, um, actually, that uh, T.R. said of Nanny Lodge. T.R. described Nanny Lodge as one who looked the way a queen ought to look, but as no queen I have ever seen does look. And that really, I think, says it all. Here's another photograph of, of Nanny Lodge. She didn't like being photographed, as I'm sure you guys can tell. John Singer Sargent, the great portraitist, begged her to let him paint her. She wouldn't do it, which is too bad, because I would have loved to have seen that. This is, these are a couple of people who play peripheral roles in the book. On the left is a gentleman by the name of Donald Cameron, who was a senator from Pennsylvania. On the right is his wife, Elizabeth Sherman Cameron. Elizabeth Sherman Cameron is one of the great 
women of the Gilded Age. Elizabeth Sherman Cameron comes to Washington at 19. She was hoping to marry a lawyer uh, in her native Ohio. Her family, whose her two uncles were John Sherman, then the senator from Ohio and the man who was hoping to be president. Anybody know who the other Sherman might have been? Exactly, exactly right. Yeah, William Tecumseh Sherman, exactly right. They would not allow Elizabeth to marry a humble lawyer. They wanted her to marry a man of means and a man of position. So she comes to Washington and finds Donald Cameron, a very wealthy man whose family had made millions in the steel industry and who was the sitting senator from Pennsylvania. Cameron was also an alcoholic and not a terribly nice man. Elizabeth, though, dealt with the marriage the best she could. She wrote a letter to her mother describing the marriage as saying, well, it's not too bad because he really only comes around me when I call him. Here's another picture of Elizabeth Cameron. This is personally one of my favorite pictures. And the man next to her is a guy by the name of John Hay. John Hay had a tremendous career. He was Lincoln's personal secretary. He was a great author. He would become Theodore Roosevelt's secretary of state. And possibly, though we're not 100% sure, he also may have had an affair with Nanny Lodge. But the woman who was the apple of his eye for his entire life was Elizabeth Cameron, who he worshipped and adored and spent as much time with him as he possibly could. And they all spent time together with a gentleman by the name of Henry Adams. I don't have a photograph with him. I, I took it out. But Adams was a great correspondent. And the three of them uh, spent tons of time together. Hay actually lived next to Henry Adams, in a house that was identical to uh, Henry Adams' house in Lafayette Square in Washington. It's now the Hay Adams Hotel. Beautiful house, and that house was the most sought after dinner invitation in Washington for both of them. Everybody wanted to go to have dinner with John Hay. Everybody wanted to go and have dinner with uh, Henry Adams. In fact, here's Henry Adams right here. Henry Adams was one of the great correspondents of American history. If you want to know what gossip was going on in the Gilded Age, I'd encourage you to read the, one of the four volumes of his letters, Letters of Henry Adams. They're absolutely wonderful. If you want to read about all these people and perhaps what they really were like, I would encourage you to read those books. They're just fabulous. Here are two other members of the Lodge family. This is George Cabot, otherwise known as Bay Lodge, who was Henry Cabot Lodge's eldest son, and his wife, Matilda Frillingham Lodge, known as Bessie Lodge. As you can tell, this is another goddess portrait. Uh, and Bessie Lodge was another great beauty, very much like Nanny in the respect that she spoke, she understood, she could recite Latin fluently. She was a great lover of education. Her mother, however, uh, was not keen on her daughter, Bessie, being educated. She believed that if she spent too much time in school, she'd become a literary bore. And what Mrs. Davis wanted um, her daughter to do was marry well. She wanted her to marry a Vanderbilt. Mrs. Davis was a very prominent socialite in Washington, very much a social doyen. It was rumored that she had a long time affair with President Chester A. Arthur. When her husband was given the position as Arthur's secretary, under Secretary of State, Nobody was really that surprised who knew uh, the family well. This is an incredible romance, and uh, 
uh, Bay Lodge's life is very, very interesting, and I'm not going to uh, go on and tell you much about it, but needless to say, uh, Henry Adams, when the two of them decided to get married, he had a conversation with Mrs. Davis and proceeded to write to John Hay that the Davises had a slight problem with the idea of their daughter, their beautiful daughter, ma marrying and thus them having, quote, a poet son-in-law. Not something that they wanted. Henry Cabot Lodge didn't like the Davises either. He thought their character and virtue were suspicious, and Mrs. Davis thought that Cabot was a pompous ass. So here we have these two incredible men. One ends up becoming the senator from Massachusetts, beginning in 1893 and lasting until his death in 1924. Theodore Roosevelt, a two-term president of the United States. It's a really, I would almost describe it as one of the closest friendships ever in American history. These two men loved each other. There would be falling outs, disagreements. I'm going to let you all discover that in the book. Here again, Lodge, Roosevelt, Lodge at Oyster Bay, this beautiful house they have. It was recently restored several years ago. I encourage you to visit. This is Lodge at Nahant. As you can tell, he's an athletic looking man, if not a very sort of thin one. And the end of the story is, is, is a sad one. Roosevelt spent much too much time destroying his body through excessive sports, excessive eating, just that excessive love of life. And here we have Henry Cabot Lodge in a very haunting picture, leaving Roosevelt's funeral in Oyster Bay in 1919. It's fitting that both these men have pictures in the National Gallery of Art. It's fitting because this friendship is really one of the great ones, I believe, in American history, because both men, despite their privilege, despite their affluence, displayed timing, patience, and perseverance, and in doing that, showed everyone that they really could change the world. Thanks so very much. I appreciate it. Lodge was a conservative. He believed in the Constitution as written. Uh, he was always thinking about the political future of the Republican Party. Uh, he always wanted the Republicans to remain in power, and he spent much of the Roosevelt presidency trying to prevent Theodore Roosevelt from going too far. He actually uh, wrote a letter to Roosevelt when Roosevelt was proposing his square deal. He had had dinner with a prominent uh, Bostonian who was also a prominent Republican who was criticizing Lodge and arguing that Roosevelt was going much too far in some of these progressive uh, policies where government perhaps was becoming, uh, was imposing itself on the lives of the individual. And Roosevelt uh, Lodge wrote Roosevelt a letter where he said, you really need to tone this stuff down because people are getting very concerned. People who can contribute a lot of money to the Republican Party are unhappy with what you're doing. And Roosevelt was always trying to beg him off. But that's one of the things that leads to this falling out the two will have in 1912. Roosevelt will move much too far to the left. He will become much more of a progressive than he ever was before. And Lodge, desperately afraid that Roosevelt would be responsible for destroying the Republican Party, pushes back at him and subsequently refuses to support TR's run for the presidency in 1912. It, this virtually or nearly destroys this incredible friendship that they have. And it only is because of Roosevelt getting shot in 1912 that brings them back together. Sure, he was, he was a very difficult guy. He was not someone who a lot of members of the Senate liked. Uh, he could be very uh, contentious and very uh, difficult to be with. And actually, Roosevelt even wrote that in a letter to somebody where he said, you know, if you don't know 
Lodge, uh, he can come across as really cold and really icy and really unfriendly. But Roosevelt loved Henry Cabot Lodge. He thought he was just the greatest man he, he'd ever met, and Lodge felt the same uh, for Theodore Roosevelt. Anything else? Hi, yeah. So the first, they initially, Lodge and Roosevelt, both, as I said, were, were, uh, had attended Harvard. They were both members of Porcellian. And Lodge was a professor at Harvard when Roosevelt was an undergraduate. Not the best professor in the world because Lodge started out, I believe, in his first class with a class of about 20. It went down rapidly to about four. No student evaluations then, uh, folks. <laughs> and so they, they met one another, probably at Porcellian occasionally, but it was really not until this 1884 convention where they met. And it was due to a letter that Ro at Lodge wrote to Roosevelt saying, you know, I'm wondering, you and I are both against James Blaine uh, being nominated. Would you like to get together and maybe take a trip down to Washington and... Uh, talk to some potential candidates who might step in if we could get uh, Blaine removed. And that's how uh, this relationship began. Uh, Roosevelt was literally clearing out the house that he had lived, with, lived in with Alice Lee uh, when he received this letter. And he was literally getting it ready uh, to sell. And Lodge comes down to New York from Boston and they got on the train together and they went down to Washington and had this fantastic conversation. And that's where this friendship really began. Your second question, um, it's difficult to know. I'm, I'm hopeful that uh, people are saving their emails, uh, you hope. Uh, then uh, we're hopeful that all of these, uh, uh, dare I say, classified documents um, will be, uh, will be kept and stored, uh, but it, it does, it gets harder and harder. And that was one of the reasons I had such a joy in doing this book, was because of these fabulous letters that I got to read. I never thought they would be as outspoken uh, as they were and just found some marvelous things. And I'll tell you one brief marvelous story which I thought was just great. Uh, Lodge, as I said at the beginning of this talk, was always asking Roosevelt for something when he was in the White House. Could you hire this person? Would you do this for me? Would you do that? And there was a moment where Lodge asked uh, Roosevelt to uh, write a proclamation for a community in Massachusetts that was celebrating its bicentennial. Roosevelt writes back to Lodge and literally says, my dear man, please do not send me something like this ever again. I'm getting this stuff night and day. I don't need to get it from you. And Lodge wrote back, oh, I was only kidding. A man with no sense of humor can't possibly be kidding. Um, any other questions? Yeah, yeah. There were, also, uh, there, was all, there were also primaries in 1912, not the types that we've got today because political bosses still ran uh, the states back then. But Roosevelt did very well in the primaries. It was supposedly, uh, well not supposedly this did happen, it's, it's unknown if Roosevelt knew about it, Lodge essentially took control of the primary in Boston to arrange for Taft to win that. And I have no idea if Roosevelt knew or, or didn't know. Um, there was another, yeah, hi. Oh, lots of them, yeah. Hopefully not too many. <laughs> Hopefully my writing will carry the story along. Uh, yes. Third person, yeah. Um, did I see another question up there, or did I not? Yeah, uh, yeah. sorry. That was Lodge's grandson, Henry Cabot Lodge Jr., who was very close to his, his grandfather and, and knew him quite well. H.C.L. Uh, Sr. loved to joke that he was the first man of his Harvard class to be married, first class man in his Harvard class to have children, and first class in his Harvard, first man in Harvard class to be a grandfather. Uh, they were very different figures. Uh, Cabot Jr., I think, was much more congenial and convivial than his, um, than his grandfather was. Yeah, hi. They loved it. 
Um, the one thing was that both that that Lodge wasn't keen on Roosevelt uh, joining uh, joining and creating his Rough Riders. Uh, he was very worried that something was going to happen to him. But when Roosevelt proved to be unbelievably successful, Lodge wrote a letter where he said, basically, you more or less can have anything you want politically. Um, yeah, hi. Can you tell us um, about the Rough Riders? Yeah, sure. The, the Rough Riders were a group of, of individuals, who most of whom came from Harvard, Yale, Princeton, et cetera, and you had also some from the West who all decided to get together and fight uh, Spain. And they had a great time doing it. There's a wonderful book uh, called The Crowded Hour, which will tell you a lot about uh, the Rough Riders, if you, if you, uh, if you want to read it. But uh, Roosevelt had a ball. He wrote a letter to Lodge where he said, you should see all these men, you know, people who belong to the Knickerbocker Club washing, washing so-and-so's clothing. Um, because it's just great. It was, it was very much a wonderful uh, camaraderie and, and a wonderful, wonderful scene. Can we take one more question in the time book? Sure. Hi. What did you mind? Yeah, well, obviously, he went after the, the railroad industry and, and did several things that... Uh, uh, you know, essentially broke up some of the monopolies. Roosevelt wanted to try to give the impression that he was a great trust buster. And he wasn't really, he didn't really break up uh, that many uh, trusts. Uh, that was something Lodge wasn't particularly in favor of either. Uh, just again, it alienated a lot of Republicans who could donate money and uh, a lot of support that Lodge believed the Republican Party needed to stay in power. Thanks so much again. I appreciate it.